Okay, and we're here for week 14, which is our final, 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 regularly scheduled recorded class. Congratulations! Aren't you happy? Yay! Well, maybe. Are you a little sad? Well, maybe not. Okay, I'll give you that. So what's up with this final recorded regularly scheduled class? Notice my modifiers. Regularly scheduled class. So today, uh, first I want to let you know that the final exams timetable is now available. It's a click through the CTL. And we'll take a look at that. Also, while this is our final scheduled, regularly scheduled recorded class, I will do a final review on top of the Zoom class that we will have on Thursday, okay? After that Zoom class, I will record a final review which will not be counted in the Chosukbu. Watch it, don't watch it, it's up to you probably be about 30 or 40 minutes maybe uh, remember that our final test is all semester tonight we're going to look at a fun the comedians uh, approach to death by PowerPoint you've heard me talk about PowerPoint and you've seen how I use PowerPoint and I'm going to compare it to uh, some horrible versions of PowerPoint and we're also going to talk about what some people think is an ideal type of PowerPoint it's not something that I really believe in I use it sometimes but not so much we're also going to look at another section in the book and we're going to prepare for Thursday's conversation tasks all right so first, let's take a look at the CTL. And I've got a bunch of stuff here, so I have to wiggle things around a little bit. The week of June 15. Uh, last week, I introduced the topic of gold, silver, and earthen spoons. Some people call it dirt spoon, uh, plus diamond spoons and platinum spoons. But we didn't actually have time to talk about it. Well, I could have made time if we ran our Zoom longer. But it's getting to the end of the semester. I was kind of pooped, and we just finished at around, I think it was 48 minutes or something, which the school says is officially, technically long enough, even though we're supposed to go 75. Uh, but since I'm doing a final bonus review, I'm not too worried about that. And we're going to talk a little bit more about public servants' pay. You remember I mentioned it last time about how in the olden days public servants were poor. Maybe they're not now. And again, we're going to do a little bit on death by PowerPoint. Now, um, these two articles, I'm going to flip through them really quickly tonight so that we don't have to spend much time on Thursday looking at the articles. We can spend most of our time talking about the articles. That means I assume that people will watch this video, just like I talked about before. I will point out that while, as of tonight, this is Sunday night at uh, 8.58 p.m., everyone has watched the Week 12 video, and that's the school calendar says two weeks. I told you one week for the last weeks. So there were one, two, three, four people who watched the Week 12 videos sometime in Week 13. But I'm marking them absent because I said watch it in the same seven days. And the same rule applies for week 13, which we're going to take a look at right now, really quickly. I'm not pointing at any names. We're just going to look at uh, some numbers. So week 12, it now looks like all but one. But remember, I checked it last week. And right now it looks like all but three people. Well, there's three more hours for these three people to watch that video. 
or they're marked absent. Okay, so talking about the spoons, there's an article from the Korea Times from a few years ago. Oh, uh, you can't quite see that. It says Korea Times. Let me see if I can move this down. All right, it says Korea Times right over here. You see that? Give me my marker. The Korea Times. All right, move this back up because we don't need that part. And it says, oops, well, I didn't really want to do that. And now it's difficult because I have something else in a way. Inherited wealth is maybe more important than education for social standing. This is an article from uh, May of 2016. So it's four years old. The conversation that you'll have on Thursday could be related to whether that's true. Is inherited wealth more important than education? And I'm just going to read the first paragraph for you. It says, Koreans used to categorize people based on the university they attended or the provinces they came from. Oh, you're a Yonsei Day man, or you're a Sky man, right? Or you're from Gyeongsangbuk-do. These days, however, they do so based on the silver spoon or inherited wealth. And so this article is about the idea that, according to experts, inherited wealth is replacing education as a, as a key factor. Now, Korea has this spoon theory, and I'm not aware that it's, a, it's used in any other country. We do talk about being born with a silver spoon in your mouth, that you're from the, the elite classes. But the idea of diamond or gold or silver or bronze or earthen, how many levels do you want to have? The Koreans sometimes call it dirt. Um, here it says diamond is the highest strata, stratum, followed by gold, silver, bronze, and mud. So we got gold, silver, bronze, four. That makes five spoons. Their picture here is only four. All right. So that's the theme of this article, which I suggest that you read. But if you uh, go into my PowerPoint, you will find that I have here on this PowerPoint screen, a copy from the Wikipedia page. Now you don't need to memorize this. It's actually kind of a question mark. They use some different labels. They talk about gold spoon, silver spoon, bronze spoon, wooden spoon. I've heard wooden spoon before. Plastic spoon. Now this is the first time I've ever heard of this one. And finally the dirt spoon. And because it's on Wikipedia in English, they're using dollars because a lot of the world uses dollars as a, as a standard amount. This might have been done a couple years ago. We don't know the date on it. But I'm just going to add three zeros. I'm just going to say 1,000 won is a dollar to make it easy. And if you want to make it 1,241 to the dollar, that's fine. But it says the dirt spoon is less than $20,000 annual salary. So call it $20,000. Well, $1,000 is bekmanan. So that would be ichan manan or ichan sabek manan, something like that. That's pretty low. Now, it happens that there are Lots of people in Korea, for example, a lot of Hagwon teachers who count as dirt spoon. And if you're single, it might be okay. If you can arrange your housing somehow, if you can get housing for not too expensive, maybe you can live on that. <clears throat> but if you're married and you have a couple of kids, wow, it seems impossible. Then the plastic spoon, which I've never heard of, but it says... $50,000 annual salary. Well, that will be Ochan something back manan. Did you know that the median income in Korea, the middle number for income in Korea, is about Ochan obek manan? That's the median. <clears throat> that means half the people in Korea are plastic spoon or dirt spoon. 
if these numbers are believable, that's what it means. Now, notice it also says, and how much in assets? Well, 100,000, uh, 100K. K means 1,000, right? And why are some capital and some small? Because Wikipedia can be sloppy. But that would be back chan il ok, right? Thousand dollars is back manan, so ten thousand dollars is chan manan, so one hundred thousand dollars would be il ok or il ok something in assets. That basically means they own their own apartment. It's paid for, right? In Korea, uh, an apartment's going to cost at least il ok, unless you live in a small town and an old apartment or something like that your assets your first asset will be your house and then it's going to be probably your savings because most cars aren't worth much you can't really sell it for much so what do you have in savings that's pretty much your assets unless you've got a bunch of diamonds or gold or uh, something hiding a lot of land if you have a bunch of of land that would be your assets so dirt spoon plastic spoon wooden spoon Wooden spoon sounds more like the typical office man in Korea. I'm using the word office man. Yes, it's sexist, but in fact, generally, men are making more money than women. And it's not very clear here if this is for a single person or this is household income. So in my household, my wife works and I work, right? And so between the two of us, well, it's almost double what one of us would make. It's almost double. So um, I'm not saying who makes more. <laughs> For a long time, she made more. Then I made more. And now she's gotten a promotion and a pay raise. And so I'm not really sure who makes more. It's not important. It's not important. But anyway, so we got the wooden spoon. And then, you, then you're moving up. And it says the bronze spoon means you're inside. You're within the top 10% of the population. Right, the wealthiest 10% with $100,000. That's il uh, manan annual salary to e ok manan salary salary plus what would be after ok shib ok shib ok to e shib ok one in assets top 10%. So you can see it's not very balanced if the plastic spoon looks to be something like halfway. Wooden spoon, bronze spoon, silver spoon says the top 3%. Now, I've always heard of that as the top 2%, but okay, whatever. And then the gold spoon, he says the top 1%, but we've seen that uh, we've got a diamond spoon, according to the New York, uh, according to the Korea Times. So everybody divides it differently. But clearly, gold spoon is somewhere up there in that top 1% or 2%. Silver spoon is up there somewhere. They say 3%, maybe 4%, whatever. It ain't me. And it's probably not you. Spoon class. Okay. Pretty much done here. Let's just save that. And we can make it go away. So, <clears throat> when we're talking about public servants, we've got public servants. I hate when this does this. You've got public servants and the spoons. Got the article from a few years ago about the spoons. I pointed it to you. I want you to read it. If you have a problem with the online version, it's also available as a PDF. Oops, that's this one, the gold spoon. Then there's an article about public servants' pay. Again, it's available online, and it's available as a PDF. Let's take a look at public servant salaries. And just to start it, again, it's something I want you to read to prepare for the conversation on Thursday. There are many advantages, many merits, good points to being in the public service, but good salaries have never been one of them. Really? <clears throat> well, we talked about how 
50 years ago, public servants were poor. However, a survey shows that the salaries of public servants are catching up with those of workers in conglomerates. Conglomerates, the chable, the super companies. And these salaries of public servants are exceeding the salaries of workers in small to mid-sized firms. The salary has gained much attention because most Koreans are struggling with stagnant wages and rising taxes. Stagnant means not moving. Stagnant water is like after the rain, there's water sitting uh, in a hole in the street or somewhere and it starts to get stinky and it starts to grow uh, bugs and, and diseases and it's stagnant because it's not moving and it gets bad. So then the article goes on to talk about the annual average salary of a public servant. Now again, this article is from 2016. It's four years old. And it says the average salary was 58.92 million. Well, if we go back to what we saw on the Wikipedia page, that means they are above plastic, right? They're above $50,000, so they're above plastic. They're now in the wooden spoon category. The average public servant is paid more than the average income of a person in Korea. They're not paid poorly. All right, so then the next paragraph starts. After such a finding how much they're paid, taxpayers are eager to know whether public servants deserve to be paid so well. Are public servants worth it? Well, they suggest that to be deserving of high wages, public servants should be as hardworking as those in the private sector. But the reality is that public service is still stuck with inefficient management and low morale. That was four years ago. Is it still true? I don't know. Here's your public service uh, key point. This is your public personnel management. This is your public compensation, human resources. The biggest reason for the general incompetence, incompetence, not competent, not skillful, of Korea's public servants is that they do not have to be competitive to gain a pay raise. Okay? They don't have to be good. They just have to keep breathing to get their pay raise. That's what they say. Is it true? Ah, oh, that's your conversation on Thursday. All right? You don't have to agree with the article. I don't even care if you agree with the article. The point of the article is to get you thinking about the topic. Okay, so we've got a topic, public servants' salaries. We've got a topic about inherited wealth. Close. Now, I want to show you a video. We haven't shown videos in this class, and I think it might be fun. I'm going to scooch myself down a little bit here. Life after death by PowerPoint. Okay, death by PowerPoint. Well, I hope I've got the right one here. Every once in a while, these things jump around, you know? There's some things I hate about PowerPoint, and I figure it's kind of my duty to point them out. So here we go. Here's common PowerPoint mistakes. Uh, number one, uh, people tend to put every word they are going to say on their PowerPoint slides. Now, now listen to those listen to that audience that audience is filled with people who recognize this is true the best comedy is based on reality people can see that it's true and that makes it funnier although this eliminates the need to memorize your talk ultimately this makes your slides crowded wordy and boring you will lose your audience's attention before you even reach the bottom of your uh first slide Please, please don't do that anymore, please. Uh, number two. And you all know professors who do exactly that. Basically, everything they want to say is on the PowerPoint, and then they turn their back to the class, or at least they turn their shoulder to the class, and they read their PowerPoint word by word by word. And then maybe they turn and talk a little bit, and then they go back to the PowerPoint and they read, right? Two most common. Uh, many people do not run spell cheek. <laughs> Big mistake. 
Nothing makes you look stupider than spelling errors. If it's got a red line under it, recheck the spelling. Spell check, right? PowerPoint comes with a free sp spell checker. And then finally, I hate this. Uh, avoid excessive bullet pointing, only bullet key points. Too many bullet points and your key messages will not stand out. In fact, the term bullet point comes from people firing guns at annoying presenters. Hence the bullet point. Uh, bad color schemes, not good. Clashing background and font colors can lead to distraction, confusion, headache, nausea, vomiting, and loss of bladder control. I can't stay on that one too long. Here's something I've noticed. Uh, the number of PowerPoint slides you have in your talk, uh, the less uh, useful your talk actually is. Unfortunately, uh, my presentation is right there. I've also noticed this. People love to pack data into their presentations. They shove more and more data thinking it's better, but it's not. The more data you have, the harder it is to read your slide and the effectiveness plummets. Now you can, uh, you can improve the effectiveness by adding some shading and some 3D effects and then some second order and third order effects. And then, I know, let's add some labels. That'll help a lot. And that's, that's pretty much every marketing slide I've ever seen right there. And I bet you've seen some of these too. Yeah. Then some like VP of marketing standing there going, it's real clear in Q4. What the hell are you talking about? Now I'm, I'm into uh, in animation. People become animators in PowerPoint. You can have things flying all over the place and that can be good. If you're a visual learner, that will improve the effectiveness of your performance. But if you're easily distracted, more animations and people have no idea what you're talking about. They're just, wow, that is cool, wow. And there's regions here, by the way. There's the uh, simple but uh, effective region. There's the active but confusing, the uh, effective but boring, the active but ineffective, the dull but static region, the uh, busy but useless, the ADD only region, the uh, useful but amusing, the stupid but confusing, the dull triangle, the hyper triangle, the sleepy square, the dizzying pentagon, and everything else I just uh, call pointless motion. That slide right there took me an hour and a half to make right there. PowerPoint can just suck the life out of you. It's amazing. <laughs> I've also come up with this. It's a kind of a little science I've invented called font analysis. Basically, the font you choose says something about who you are as a person. There's a huge list of fonts and you choose one and that says something about you. So be careful the font you choose. For example, if you choose Courier New, uh, it happens to be my favorite, uh, you're probably organized and structured. If you choose Matisse, it means you're artistic. And if you choose Times New Roman, it means you're lazy, apathetic, and unimaginative, and you always use the default. Oh. And that's the end of that. Now, as it happens, I generally use Ariel, A-R-I-A-L. And there are some reasons for that. One of them is, in fact, that basically every computer has it. And if you use a not common font, an uncommon font, and you transfer your PowerPoint to somebody else's machine, it might get really strange because they don't have that font. Uh, another reason is because it is what we call sans serif. It doesn't have the little feet on it, which makes it a little bit cleaner, a little bit easier uh, to read when there's not a lot of words. When you're reading a book or something, very often they use a serif font that has the little feet on it that helps your eyes go across the lines very clearly and simply because there are 80 characters on a line or more and 22 lines or more on a page. And you need that little kind of a hint at the bottom of letters to keep you on the right line. But in something like PowerPoint where you're using fewer words, hopefully, uh, you don't need that. Now, kind of the opposite to uh, the death by PowerPoint that he was referring to is something that is often called uh, presentation zen. Now, zen is a Japanese word. You may know of it. In Korean, this same kind of Buddhism is called sun, sun bulgyo. You know, the gods are in the trees. Listen to the trees. The whispering wind is 
Meditation is important. Basically, presentation Zen says, simple is good. That a slide should not have more than five or seven words, maximum. A slide shouldn't have more than two pictures, maximum. And if you watch the TED Talks, that's kind of a guide for TED, is that you know, they'll have one picture up there of a butterfly or something, and the guy will talk for two minutes, and then he'll change the slide. Oh, sorry, you're missing part of this. This, this, this particular slide is somebody's talking about Piaget, who's an expert on cognitive development, and they're trying to illustrate the idea of con concrete thought. Cognitive processing, remember cognitive load, the, the thinking. So concrete thinking when you're thinking about something that can be in your hand, or abstract thinking when you're just thinking about an idea. Right? It doesn't really exist, or it doesn't exist to you. Um, I'm not a big fan of this because I work in the field of education where there's, there's pieces of information and there's data that people need to see. So we're always stuck in this middle ground between those amazing data charts that the guy talked about, right? too much data and nobody can read it and not enough data and too many words and not enough words and if you look at my powerpoints i can tell you that one of my guidelines is not more than seven lines of text if possible let's count this one i'm gonna mark it right one Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Good. I didn't pass my line. Well, sometimes I will, but generally I try to stay within seven lines. And partly what that means is that I'm using a bigger text, a bigger font size, so that it's easy to read, especially when we're doing these recordings. But even when I go to conferences and I have a wall behind me that is three meters tall of video, uh, of display, and five meters wide, yeah, I can walk up, take seven or eight steps from one side to the other. Sometimes I present in front of a, a, a wall that big. But still, my guide is try to be seven lines. And if I'm typing in font size 36 or 40, and I think if we check on this, we're going to find that this size, whoops, I need to turn that off now. This size right here is size 40, Arial size 40 basic text. In most of my presentations, the basic line, the first line, the first order is usually Ariel 40 or maybe Ariel 36. And then if I need to make something smaller, it'll usually be something like, well, there we go, 32, right? 40, 36, 32. 28 is tiny. Now, this spoon class theory, which is really tiny, I know that, and maybe you, on your smartphone you can't even read it. This one I think is 24. It's 21. Because I, I, I took it straight from Wikipedia and I threw it up here. All right. Uh, because I am only use it as a quick example. I don't expect you to read it. I don't expect you to study it. I don't expect you to know it. I sure as heck am not going to test it in terms of money. Just the idea. Gold, silver, bronze, diamond platinum, uh, wooden, dirt, and as I mentioned several times, plastic is new to me. So if we talk about spoons, you can use the spoons that are most comfortable to you. It's not important to me. So this is officially in my system much too small. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. You see 12 lines. And my goal is seven. So it's too big. But if you remember last class, I had a slide where you talked for a while and it had two words, equality and equity, and two pictures. But in fact, this is one picture that I 
store. It's just one picture. I didn't make it. Took it off the internet. Right? So, let's take a look. Hang on a second. We'll go ahead and save this again just to be safe. And then we'll shrink it. And we'll take a look at this idea. I'm not going to play this video that we're trying to make it very simple. If we sneak around here, we look at some of the previews here. Here's an area where they're talking about uh, a bad slide. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven lines of text and no visuals. And what do they say over here? Too much text, no visuals, right? So that's a complaint. If we go down here somewhere, here's a slide. One slide. Picture of people raising their hands. Sounds like they're excited. And that's what he's going to talk about. So um, but now they're going to put a title on it. And what else are they going to do on this picture, right? Maybe put a few words in it. More of the title or subtitle, something like that. And that's all it gets. So that's their that's their aim. All right. Well, we are 30 minutes into our class, and I have introduced next classes discussions. Oops, you don't need this. Sorry. Uh, where am I? Where am I? Mentioned that there'll be a final review, the timetable. That's what I wanted to get to. All right. So we need to come up here to the Mokja. And we can see there is a link. Choose your interview time and record it on the Google spreadsheet. It's just like for midterms. Do not change other people's times. Write your class name. EPA1D for day. EPA1N for night. EPA3 for EPA3. That's you guys. And write your name in, oh, Hingul, how cute. That's supposed to be Hangul. Let's see if we can't fix that. H-A-N. Very good. Save. Do not change other people's times. The first day of testing is Tuesday, January, uh, June 23rd. Now, important. I will give one bonus point. Add to the end of your test number before I curve. I will add one bonus point to people who take the test on the first day, Tuesday. In the midterm, if somebody signed up for the first day and they weren't very good at the very beginning of the test, it was clear they hadn't studied, I would say, get out, go sign another time. I do that for the midterm. I don't do that for the final. On the final test, your time is your time. Whatever you choose, you got to be ready. If you choose to go the first day, there's one bonus point before the curve. All right, let's take a look at that page. Click. There we go. Write your name in a white block. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Start 11 a.m. Finish 9.30 p.m. Friday will be a little bit short. That's my emergency time if something happens. All right. No test on Monday. Monday is officially a school day. Some classes are supposed to have a test that are supposed to have a class, a regularly scheduled class that day. Not my class. Uh, I do have a class. I don't remember what holiday it was that's scheduled for that day, but I did a recorded class, so don't have to do it. So anyway, uh, I will have available for you on Monday. A review. I hope to have it earlier than that, but we'll see. And that'll be an all semester review. So then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, anytime you choose, but you are a day class, I wish you to not register for a night class time because the night students have less chances to take a test. So day class, please take a test not later than 6.15. There's so much time. My EPA 1 day class has 39 students in it. My EPA 3 class has 16, 15 students in it. That means uh, less than 55. And there is about 80 time slots here. 
more than that, I think. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 40, 60, yeah, 80. About 80 slots. But my night class has uh, 30 students, and I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 16. 16 would be 32. It's already tight. A few of them will take a test in the day. So as you can see, all right, I much prefer you to take a test in a day. All right, that's available in the CTL. We're done with this. We can close that. We're done with this. So actually, we can close that. And you don't need to see my email, so we can close that. And that's my note. We can close that. And that's a note. We can close that. And that's a note. We can close that. And that's a note. We can close that. And we don't need that. And that's working quietly by itself. I am multitasking. So what we're doing tonight along with all the other stuff that we do, is we're looking at the last reading for our semester. And if this goes fast, maybe two. We're on page 54. We did page 48, Strategic Outsourcing, in the Zoom class last week. So we're doing page 54, Quality Means Service too. Now, quality control, uh, when this was written, the big thing was TQM. Uh, they, we've gone through a couple others, uh, 360 degree, quality management, quality circles. There's a bunch of stuff. I don't really care. They're buzzword. Somebody writes a book and a bunch of people follow it. Buzzword, a word that everybody talks about it. It's a buzzing sound. Did you hear about this? When a lot of people are talking together, the room sounds as bzzz. You can hear it at ball stadiums or whatever. So um, the, the, the form you use to promote quality and the form you use to measure quality, that will change every decade or so. That's not very important. But the themes go on. So I'm going to read this to you really quickly. It's something that is a star in my book. You can see that. Quality means service too. I'm going to read it fast. Hope you've been practicing your English. Remember about your um, listening logs. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. In the past, quality control was seen primarily as a manufacturing problem. But what makes a company stand out today is the quality of the service it provides to the customer. This has encouraged the trend towards total quality management, or TQM. All right. The quality is measured in terms of service to customer. TQM has redefined quality to mean what feels right to the consumer, uh, to the customer, excuse me. What feels right to the customer. Not what the company says is good, but what the customer says is good. For Ford, remember we talked about Ford automobiles. Love those Mustangs. For Ford, that means a toll-free number to respond to customer complaints quickly. Toll-free number. In America, that would be an 800 number. Now we have a few more. 888-800-888. There's another one now. I can't remember what it is. In Korea, it means 080. You can telephone that number. And it's free to you. You don't have to pay. For Ford, that means a toll-free number to respond to customer complaints quickly. For Federal Express, the shipping company, it means an online tracking system that allows customers to know where their packages are at any time. That system's still in, in use. Uh, Korea Postal Service has something like that now. Not exactly the same. They send you a text message when it hits a certain spot. But they also send you a... a internet code number that you can click to find out where's the last checkpoint of your package. For IBM, the computer company, they used to be a computer company, they've stopped making computers. 
It's a system that automatically recognizes trouble and alerts technicians, sometimes before the clients know they have a problem. Okay, in this time, a lot of companies had uh, mini mainframes and they were connected to IBM and IBM could monitor how things were going on. Not monitor the data, monitor the processes. Uh, now, please note that in Korea, what in English we call a technician, you often call an engineer. In the U.S., an engineer is somebody who sits with a paper and pencil or a computer um, and calculates and plans and designs and never get dirty. Somebody who fixes things is a mechanic or a technician. Mechanic sounds like they're working with machines, with motors, and they break and they get dirty. A technician sounds a little bit more sophisticated, but nowadays cars have so many computer chips in them that really a mechanic is almost more of a technician than he is of a machine mechanic. Okay, so for IBM, it's a system that automatically recognizes trouble and alerts technicians. From the customer's perspective, perspective from where you see, Everything has to run smoothly, from customer support to personal service. Hotel clerks might be polite and attentive. Can I help you? But if the computer system is down, the politeness isn't going to be enough. I reserved a room. Right? The aim of total quality management is to get everyone working together while keeping the customer in focus from production, from purchasing, getting the products to the factory, to production, to distribution, includes marketing and sales. Everybody's mind is for the customer. A serious TQM effort requires a considerable investment in time, consultants, and most difficult of all, top management attention. It's very easy for some manager or CEO to say, oh, we're doing uh, TQM, or we're doing a 360 management, and you, Jones, you're a vice president, handle it. And then the president goes away and doesn't think about it anymore. It doesn't work that way. Okay? Top management attention, all the way to the top. But some CEOs like Fred Smith of Federal Express are obsessive. Obsessive. They can never not think about it. It's, it's so important to me. Uh, it, it, it really has to be the be-all and end-all, Smith declares. Okay, so we're talking about an idea that if quality isn't the main focus, then nothing is the focus. Quality is the reason we're in business. If we don't have quality, we're not selling well. So that's the key point. Now, at the bottom, you see some questions. You can do those on your own. I'm going to skip ahead to the last reading, and that will be our end for the night, pretty much. Now, the next chapter doesn't have a good reading. We're not going to play with that. We're going to go all the way up, skip chapter 10, move to chapter 11, and the last reading is in some ways related. This is page 66, and I basically never go past page 66 in this book. Page 66 also has a star on it, if you can see that. Page 66 says, Hon sometimes honesty is the best policy. In U.S., every kid has heard this. It's always talked about in school. Honesty is the best policy. Policy, policy Jung check. well, it doesn't just mean government. It means my, my policy, my way of living, my approach to doing things. And we hope people would say, well, always honesty is the best policy. Honesty is always the best choice. But in fact, in reality, we know many people don't think so. So we're going to read this really quick. Same kind of way. You can read it more yourself. But the topic is something that can be on your final test. In more than 40 years as a salesperson, page 66, Jacques Verth has accomplished at least two things. Two things. He's made a lot of money, 
and he's learned a lot about sales, enough to write a book entitled High Probability Selling. Wirth's view of selling is simple but unusual. Just be honest. The following is from an interview with Werth. Now, before we continue, I'm using his name the German way, Werth. His first name is Jacques, which is French. If he is, in fact, a European, he could be from that part of Europe that over the past 200 years has jumped back and forth. Actually, the ground hasn't changed, but for a while it was part of France. Napoleon took it from what were Germans, and it stayed France for a while, and then the Germans took it back, and then there was World War I, and there was World War II, and they went back and forth. And so if you've had the beer, it's actually not exactly beer, comes in a can like beer, and it's 1632. I think that's the right number, 1632. It's a silvery can with blue and red writing. I really like it. It's not exactly beer. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but I really like it. It's kind of sweet, kind of sour, almost like a juice, almost like a champagne, kind of. Uh, it's from Cologne or Korn. K-O-L-N is how the Germans spell it. C-O-L-O-G-N, you know, like the spray, the cologne that women buy and men buy for smell. Same city. Well, it's in that area between France and Germany. Germany's famous for beer. France is famous for wine and champagne. Guess what? It's something that kind of mixes between the two. And in that area, there's a lot of people who have a French first name and a German last name or they have a German first name and a French last name, because there's been a lot of intermarriage, right? Original German families, original French families who married. People in that area are usually at least bilingual, often trilingual, English, German, French. English is the third language, the last language maybe they learn. Okay, so I'm using the name Jacques Werth. But if he were living in England for a long time, he'd say, I probably Jack Worth. And the question in an interview, what is the biggest mistake salespeople make? And Jacques says his answer. Most people think that it's important to be aggressive in sales. Push, push, push. But the opposite is true. Aggressive people are too pushy. They try to persuade people to convince them to buy. Question, why? Aren't salespeople supposed to persuade people? And he says, most people dislike being persuaded. They don't like it. It's much better to find consumers who want to buy your product and arrive at an arrangement, find a meeting place that makes everybody happy. How do you do that? You find out quickly who isn't going to buy your product and move on. Don't waste your time with people who aren't going to buy it. You're going to push hard. It's going to make you tired. It's going to make them angry. That's lose-lose. They don't want it. Forget about it. Move on. People may be interested, but they're not necessarily going to buy. They don't have the money. Don't waste your time. Oh, it's really interesting. It's really cool. Oh, and they eat your popcorn or whatever it is that you have as, a, as an attraction, but they're not going to buy. Don't waste your time. They just waste your time. Question, so what kind of person makes the best salesperson? He says, honest people who will listen to the customers and tell the truth. That's pretty shocking. Salespeople are famous for lying, right? Uh, used car salesman is the worst story in America. The used car salesmen are the people who are most famous for lying. It's a beautiful car. It'll fit you fine. Oh, yeah, we can make this adjustment. Everything's fine. You know, the second biggest liar probably for salespeople, probably, Computer software specialists, the companies that design software for businesses, the company that designs software for Gamian University. We've bought so much uh, applications, the CTL, right, the student service, the Edwards system, the groupware system, which was down for two days over this past weekend. They sold us something they said it would work, and then... It never worked the way we wanted, and then we wanted to make changes, and oh, they couldn't do it, and then finally they go away. Okay, that's a problem. 
there's a cartoon series in America for uh, computer technicians, engineers who are designing systems. And the sales team is always selling stuff. It's like it comes back to the engineer and he says, we can't do that. It's not possible. Or we can't do that in less than a year. Well, yeah, but we promise we deliver it in two months. Well, we can't do that. Well, give them something. Right? Salesmen are famous for, for selling things that they don't have, that aren't available, that aren't going to work. Uh, one of my friends told me this horrid story. I was shocked that, uh, as you may know, European television systems are different than American television systems. Now, Korea uses a system that's very, very similar to U.S., not exactly the same. Uh, the audio stereo, the stereo audio on a TV is a little bit different in U.S. than Korea. But the visual is the same. In France, it's different. In Europe, it's different. So uh, some Europeans were on a cruise ship, you know, love book kind of thing. And they stopped in San Diego. And they went to this camera shop because their camcorder had died. They wanted to buy a new one. And so they asked if this camcorder in the store would would be good for them. And the guy said, yeah, sure, of course, it's perfect. It's a wonderful camcorder, da 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 After they left, the salesman was laughing because it won't connect to a European TV. European TVs use a PAL system, a PAL system. And American TVs use an NTSC system. And the camcorder, you could watch the videos on the camcorder, but if you try to plug it into a to a, a European TV, it won't display correctly. You could convert it to computer, but this was years ago when few people had computers. So basically, this salesman lied in order to make a big sale. Is honesty the best policy? That's a tough question. If you work in the public service, probably yes, but what if the citizens are asking something that you know the mayor or the big boss doesn't want you to talk about? What if you work for the police department and you're trying to hide that something happened? It's hard. It's a tough choice. Uh, I teach ethics in graduate school, and I will tell you that it's never good to lie. I will admit that sometimes it's a good idea to not say everything. Don't tell the whole truth. Don't say everything. But it's never a good idea to lie. Okay, so as a reminder, we will be talking on Thursday about the topics that I showed you. Okay, the two readings. We're going to talk about public servant pay. We're going to talk about gold and silver spoons. And we're going to spend as much time as possible talking, conversing. And there's no real right answer. It's mostly talking. And the gold, silver spoon, public servant pay, and these last two readings can be on your final exam. So do pay attention to that. We're at 53 minutes, and I think that's enough for our last regularly scheduled recorded class. Thank you very much. I'll see you in Zoom. And I'll see you in the review class, if you come to that. Thank you very much. Take care. Study well.